We're going to continue our lessons with the topic of ocean acidification. And you've had a great opportunity to watch a TED Talk and a little uh, documentary by Sigourney Weaver. And so we'll just kind of bring a little more chemistry to the process of ocean acidification. We know that seawater is basic, so its pH is naturally greater than 7.00. pH is approximately 8.2 of any um, ocean water. So if its rain is naturally acidic, but the oceans are basic, how does this work? The secret lies in the chemistry of the carbonate ion, carbonate CO3 2 negative, that polyatomic ion, carbonate. The bicarbonate ion, which adds a single proton, so CO3 negative one, and then carbonic acid, H2CO3, and it's now neutral. So we have carbonate, bicarbonate, and carbonic acid. And how those um, species interact with each other to help maintain a constant pH. This is actually known as a buffering system. The same mechanism that keeps the homeostasis inside of our uh, blood, in our bodies, that mechanism that maintains our homeostatic level of our blood pH of about 7.4, helps to maintain the homeostatic level, the constant level of the pH of an ocean at 8.2. They're produced from carbon dioxide dissolving in water. It's carbon dioxide a natural component of our atmosphere. When it dissolves in water, it combines with water and it forms the acid known as carbonic acid, H2CO3. Now I know we've been practicing the decomposition. When it decomposes, carbonic acid decomposes and gives off CO2 and water. So we have a decomposition process breaking down into simpler pieces but we also have a combination where we produce a larger compound from a building blocks of CO2 and water so see how they're just reversible reactions this carbonic acid that forms then undergoes a series of steps so H2CO3 can ionize and when it does so, it releases a single hydrogen ion and a hydrogen carbonate ion. This hydrogen carbonate ion can undergo a decomposition and let go of that second hydrogen and giving us back the carbonate ion. So here we have kind of a, a, a mechanism where all of these species are interrelated by the hydrogen ion. The formation of the acid H2CO3 happens during, let's say, acid rain when the carbon dioxide is dissolved in the water. When the acid rain lands in the ocean, we're going to see this homeostatic mechanism where H2CO3 can release a hydrogen ion and it can increase the acidity Right, because anything that is going to release a hydrogen ion makes it more acidic. Or if we consider the opposite direction, if the bicarbonate ion accepts back on the proton going back to the acid, it is going to decrease the acidity, making it more basic. So it's these opposite trends, these opposite reactions where we can go in the forward direction and release protons, or we can go in the reverse direction and sop up some of these extra protons and then help to maintain a constant pH level. So that's what we're going to study when we look at ocean acidification, how the carbonate, bicarbonate, and carbonic acid all interrelate by adding or subtracting acid ions called protons. Now in your sapling, you'll be asked to draw the Lewis dot structures for those species called carbonate, bicarbonate, and carbonic acid. And they'll give you a page reference. Page 254 in your text is going to provide those uh, examples for you as, as well. Carbon is the central atom in each of those. So carbonate, CO3, has a central atom of carbon and three oxygens. 
The three oxygens will have one that is double bonded and two lone pairs of electrons and two oxygens that are single bonded with three lone pairs of electrons and a negative one, see this negative charge? This one will model that as well. We'll have three sets of paired electrons unbonded and again another negative charge. Remember CO3 is a minus two. The first of the negative charges is on this oxygen and the second of that negative charge is on this oxygen. So we have a neutral oxygen, two lone pairs. We have two oxygens that have three lone pairs each carrying a minus two charge. This is the polyatomic ion called carbonate. When we add on a proton or add on the hydrogen ion, one of those hydrogens in the first step will attach to the oxygen that originally had the negative charge. So notice since this is neutral, there's no pull to put it on a positive charge. The pull will be on either of these negatively charged oxygen. So we get something called the bicarbonate ion. Sometimes you'll hear it called hydrogen carbonate. And remember learning that if you hear hydrogen carbonate, sometimes you'll hear that bicarbonate instead of hydrogen carbonate. So the bicarbonate ion took a positive hydrogen and added it to the carbonate ion. We get HCO3 negative. So again, I'd have to draw in the lone pairs and this now would have two lone pairs and you'd have an attachment here. So H is now bonded to the oxygen which is bonded to the carbon. And that oxygen has two lone pairs on it. And again we have carbonic acid where both of those oxygens have now been neutralized adding the hydrogen to each of those originally negatively charged. And of course there's just two lone pair creating the neutral octet rule. So there we're looking at carbonate, bicarbonate, and carbonic acid in terms of the Lewis dot structures. This carbonate ion plays a very critical role in any type of species of marine life that builds an outer shell and that shell is built of calcium carbonate, CO3 minus 2. Calcium carbonate is the constituent of coral sea urchins, mollusks, and any other ocean marine life that have shells built out of calcium carbonate. We must have carbonate ion present in the oceans in order for the deposition of the calcium carbonate shell on these sea urchins, mollusks, corals, and the like. If we dissolve carbon dioxide in water, which is what acid rain does, we create this carbonic acid H2CO3. When this H2CO3 lands in the ocean, it affects the homeostasis of the carbonate ion. In other words, when the H2CO3, just as we had written a moment ago, breaks apart, we dissociate and give H plus and HCO3 negative and the HCO3 negative can let go of its next proton and give us H plus and CO3 negative 2. So again, this must be present to build shells, to build these outer you know, um, shells of calcium carbonate to build, I didn't spell it right, to build shells of marine life. So what happens then as we start to acidify oceans, as we start to increase the number of hydrogen ions, and we do so by, you know, the, the effect of acid rain depositing H2CO3 into the oceans. And by placing H2CO3 into the ocean, we start this mechanism where we increase the acidity of the ocean by releasing a proton in a step-by-step -step fashion. So if we increase the acidity, we need to balance that. And what we'll do to, to you know, bring that back to a homeostatic level, we need to start pushing this reaction backwards 
to absorb the extra hydrogen ion. And what gets used in the process to absorb the extra acid is the carbonate ion. So the carbonate ion is now being used like a sponge. And the sponge is mopping up or soaking up all of these extra protons, all that were delivered by acid rain. So what happens to the amount of carbonate available to build shells for our marine life? It significantly decreases. And since there is a lack of carbonate available for the marine life to build their shells, we start to see their, um, their natural homeostatic levels begin to fall out of whack as well. So we have a direct cause and effect as carbon dioxide levels rise in the atmosphere and combined with the water from rain or humidity and land in the ocean, we set off the mechanism here, these chemical reactions, that increases the acidity of the ocean. When I say increase the acidity of the ocean, keep in mind what we're saying is pH levels drop. We're becoming more and more acidic as we climb down the pH number line. So we start to see pHs instead of in the normal range of acid rain or of typical rain somewhere around in the 5 to 6 region, we start to move down the number line because we're adding more protons. We need to have a mechanism that will suck up these extra protons and get back to the natural state of the ocean, especially as over here in the 8. We can't afford the oceans to start decreasing their pH. So what happens is the carbonate ion will combine with the extra proton to give us car uh, bicarbonate. And the bicarbonate even has extra room to absorb the hydrogen ion, decreasing acidity here, taking out that extra proton. And what happens? Well, of course, this gets consumed. And the more acid rain we deposit, the more carbonate gets soaked up, gets used up to you know, take these extra protons out of the water, and therefore less is available for the marine life to build shells. So over the past 200 years, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has significantly increased. So of course, more and more carbon dioxide dissolving in the ocean, forming carbonic acid. That's our definition of ocean acidification. We talked about carbon footprints in the previous section of, and previous chapters, carbon footprint in the terms of uh, global warming. The more carbon dioxide in the air increases global warming, but it also increases acid rain. And acid rain is now going to affect the pH of our oceans. And what happens is the available carbonate ion that's incorporated into marine animal shells for skeletons significantly is reduced this carbonate ion that's supposed to become calcium carbonate, the component of shells, is now being employed into a different chemical reaction so that this proton or this excess acid ion called the hydrogen ion combines with the carbonate to produce bicarbonate. And of course, what's now being prevented is the formation of the calcium carbonate. The carbonate itself comes from the shells and as the acid rain begins to significantly increase we'll see the decomposition of the marine shells to create even more carbonate to sop up the extra protons from the result of acid rain. So carbonate ions in seawater drastically reduce in the presence of the acid ion from the source of acid rain. We'll start to dissolve the ocean's marine life shells to create a source of carbonate ions to maintain the constant level pH of ocean water. So the ocean scientists' predictions within the next 40 years, this carbonate ion concentration will be low enough that shells of sea creatures near the ocean surface will actually begin to dissolve. The Great Barrier Reef on the coast of Australia is growing at the slowest rate than it has ever grown before. Not only is this because of increased acid concentration, but also increased global warming, and we know that reactions run faster 
at higher temperatures. So warming the water accelerates the reaction, increasing the acid rain accelerates the reaction, and we're running into some global problems. So here we have just kind of a picture of the carbon dioxide cycle. Here in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide is being released by smokestacks of industries, or by cars, or carbon dioxide in general adding to the global warming effect by human activity. Carbon dioxide is going to combine with water either from the ocean or from rain, and it gets deposited into the waters. As CO2 combines with water, we build an acid. This is called carbonic acid. When the acid gets deposited into the ocean, it breaks apart, releasing an acid ion. Remember the pH scale? It measures the concentration of the H+. And so if we're adding more and more H+, the levels of acid begin to rise in the water. Now this bicarbonate ion is also a byproduct of the carbonic acid dissociating to release the hydrogen. This hydrogen then needs to be absorbed. We can't keep affecting the pH of our waters. We have to counteract the pH balance. So to counteract that, we take the carbonate that came from the corals or the marine life shells, decomposing to release the carbonate so it can be used to mop up this extra proton from the result of acid rain. And it's cyclical. The more and more acid that deposits into the water, the more the corals and the shells of our marine life have to decompose to release the carbonate ion to absorb back that extra proton to maintain the constant level of homeostasis in the waters. So the challenge of measuring pH of rain, when it rains, carbon dioxide dissolves into the water and we start to see a result in the pH somewhere between 5 and 6, which is quite acidic. Remember that the pH is 5 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 6. At times, acid rain can become even more acidic than this. If we start to have pH ranges of 4 or even 3, we start to have extreme situations of acid rain. And as we begin to measure those uh, situations, some of the tools we know that we measure pH with, we talked about litmus. Red is acid and blue is base. Acid is red and blue is base. But we also have this digital meter that just, you know, you take this electrode and dip it in a solution, you get a digital readout. So this is a pH of 5.48 units. 5.48, again, is an acid pH number. So we try to collect samples around the country and measure the rain and some of the monitoring goes on. Here's just a, an example of the state of Illinois. They have all these different stations set up to measure pH. They collect rainwater and what they'll do is just measure the pH using I would suggest not litmus because we want an exact number, so they'll put a pH meter in there. And you'll just start to see collection of all this data to see where we have differences in pH. Where is it most acidic? Where is it least acidic? And what is it around that area that's leading to the change in the normal range of rain? So rain is naturally acidic. Rainwater, not the oceans. The oceans are naturally basic due to the carbonate presence of corals and, and uh, uh, mollusks and things that have shells. But rain is naturally acidic because one of the major components of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide producing carbonic acid. And of course, carbonic acid is going to release the hydrogen ion, which we measure on the pH scale to give us a normally acidic range. So carbonic acid dissociates slightly leading to rain with a pH of about 5.3. So rain is naturally acidic due to the presence of carbon dioxide and other components in the air. This is a graphic that's very interesting. If we're just kind of looking uh, in terms of rain and you know just kind of get an idea. The more green the more um, 
naturally uh, the rain is falling in its natural pH range about 5.3 look at the entire western part of the atmosphere here in very solid green but as you start to move toward the eastern seaboard especially where this box is we start to increase the level of acidity and there's even some reds here in Ohio and again along the shores of Lake Erie now what's going on in Pennsylvania Ohio and even a little bit of Kentucky here what we have going on is the highly industrialized part of the country. So a lot of smokestacks, a lot of industry contributing these pollutants into the atmosphere such as sulfur dioxides and nitrous dioxides and all of these S's and O's oxides are going to combine with water and contribute to even increased levels of acid rain. So the extra acidity must be originating somewhere in this heavily industrialized part of the country. There's a direct tie between the production of sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, all of these components that we're collectively calling SOX, where X represents any of the subscripts on the oxygen for the sulfur component, or NOX, where this X is going to represent any of the subscripts on the nitrogen oxide components. And again, when these molecules combine with water, they create acid. And just kind of thinking of that combination reaction, start with the H's and end with the O's, you simply add them up. You're going to get H2SO3. This is called sulfurous acid, sulfurous acid. Or if it combines with SO3, H2O plus SO3, again, a byproduct of industrial um, smokestacks releasing that industrial byproduct. We're going to create an acid called H2SO4. This is called sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid is commonly known as battery acid, a very, very strong acid. And just carrying that idea down, if we have water combining with nitrous oxide NO we're going to make an acid called and again I have to balance this because we have uh, two H's two N's and two three O's we're going to produce nitric acid and again if NO2 reacts we're going to produce nitrous acid so again acids start with the H and when this happens we begin to drastically affect the pH of rain, which again lands in the oceans or in the Great Lakes, if we're up by uh, you know the Lake Erie, Great Lakes region of our country here. If the acid rain deposits in these natural fresh waters, we're going to affect the pH of those systems as well. So here we have that chemistry we were just uh, taking a look at. We have the sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide combining with water creating acids. Acids called sulfurous or sulfuric acid. And of course we know that acids then release their protons and the measurement of pH, the more hydrogen ion in the water, the more acidic the solution becomes. So the presence of these pollutants from industry is directly affecting the pH of rain. So acid rain is produced by carbon dioxide, SOX and NOx, sulfur oxide components and nitrous oxide components. Complete the following, says our sapling homework. When SO3, sulfur trioxide, combines with water, we produce an acid called H2SO4, sulfuric acid. Notice there's two H's, one sulfur, and a total of four oxygens. We're just balancing the equation by adding those components together. Balancing the equation, H2SO4, called sulfuric acid, battery acid. When calcium carbonate reacts with an acid ion, we're going to produce the calcium plus two ion and carbonic acid, H2CO3. Carbonic acid is the result here. 
And remember this source came from corals or mollusks, things with shells in the ocean. The carbonate begins to get eaten away by the acid and the acid then combines onto the carbonate releasing the aqueous ion of calcium. Nitric acid, the NOx, probably even nastier, we have nitrous oxide, NO2, combining with water and molecular oxygen from the air producing nitric acid, a very strong acid. And for whatever reason, this got written in the wrong spot. The nitric acid is this guy right here, HNO3. And just like sulfuric acid, it's going to release its proton as well. And so, again, this got a little scrambled. HNO3 is going to release its proton and the aqueous nitrate ion. And this aqueous hydrogen ion, the more and more and more that's produced, the more it's going to affect the pH of our solution. It becomes more acidic. So the pollutants NOx, SOx, and carbon dioxide all directly contribute to the acid rain by dissolving in water to produce an acid. These sulfur dioxide emissions, SO2 is sulfur, these sulfur dioxide emissions, SO2 is sulfur dioxide, are highest in the regions where we have coal-fired electric power plants, just as we saw with global warming, a direct effect of coal-fired power plants, steel mills, and other heavy industries, industries that rely on coal. You saw that picture in uh, Pennsylvania, is such an area. 1990, it led the United States in atmospheric sulfur dioxide concentrations. And the reason they could detect that, the pH of the rain was about 3. I mean, that's pretty darn acidic, isn't it? The pH of our stomach juice is about 2. And so burning the sulfur had a direct effect on the atmospheric concentration of the protons increasing the rain. So burning sulfur and oxygen, this is actually a combustion type reaction, isn't it? Burning sulfur produces sulfur dioxide. And if coal contains sulfur, which it does, about one to three percent of coal contains sulfur and part by mass, burning the coal directly contributes to sulfur dioxide that sulfur dioxide then reacts with water to form acid. Sulfur dioxide can undergo another oxygen molecule to form sulfur trioxide. And a lot of these come from aerosols. So again, aerosols contributing to acid rain, burning coal contributing to acid rain, and knowing that these are collectively called SOx molecules, combining with the water, produces acids, either H2SO3, sulfurous, or H2SO4, sulfuric, depending upon what the subscript was originally on the sulfur oxide. We have a chemical formula for coal we examined in our uh, fuels chapter, C135H9609NS. Calculate the percent of carbon in coal by mass. And I know it will ask in our sampling, perhaps yours will, mine did, the sulfur content as well. So we get to review a little percent by mass. Carbon has an atomic weight of 12, and there's 135 of those. 12 times 135 is 1620 grams of carbon per mole. Here we have hydrogen. It weighs an atomic weight of 1, and there's 96 of them in the chemical formula of coal. So that's contributing 96 units to the entire unit. Oxygen has an atomic weight of 16, and there's 9 of those in our formula. 16 times 9 is 144. Nitrogen weighs on the atomic table 14, and there's one of those, so it's contributing 14. And uh, sulfur has an atomic weight of 32, and there's just one of those in the formula, so 32 is its contribution. 
what's the sum of all of the weights in carbon? So carbon at 1620 total weight plus the 96 from the hydrogen plus the 144 coming from the oxygen's contribution to the total weight, 14 on the nitrogen and 32 for sulfur, giving me a sum of 1906 grams altogether. So this is what we refer to as the molar mass of our compound called coal. The percent of carbon was asked for in this particular slide. The contribution of 620 grams of carbon out of the entire mass of 1906 grams, and just taking part over whole and expressing it as a percent. So my 1620 divided by the entire mass times 100, we're getting about 84.99, so we'll say 85% by mass carbon. And the contribution here from sulfur, 32 grams of sulfur, out of the total weight of 1906 grams expressed as a percent. So 32 divided by 1906 expressed as a percent gives us about 1.68 percent by mass sulfur. So coal contributes sulfur emissions, burning coal contributes sulfur emissions to the atmosphere. As sulfur is burned, it combusts or combines with the oxygen, producing sulfur dioxide. The sulfur dioxide can combine with the uh, rain, which is a source for water, giving us the acid. So there we can see the contribution of burning coal, to some extent, from our fossil fuel burning. The highest NOx emissions are generally found in states with large urban areas, high population density, heavy automotive traffic. So it's not surprising that the highest levels of atmospheric nitrogen dioxide come over Los Angeles County, the car capital of the country, not in production but in usage. So nitrogen dioxide gas in the atmosphere reacts with the hydroxyl radical to form nitric acid. So let's take a look at that closer. Here's the nitrogen dioxide and the hydroxide radical. Now a radical means that it has just one electron. The one electron instead of a partnered pair will react. It's highly reactive. We're going to talk about radicals in greater detail when we get to chapter 9, our po uh, polymerization reactions, but uh, with plastics and so forth. But for now, a radical is an unpartnered electron, and it's going to give us a direct source of acid rain, nitric acid. This is called a hydroxyl radical, OH, with just one electron instead of two. It has an odd number of electrons on its oxygen. The term radical makes it highly, highly reactive. And this, of course, is a molecule of acid known as nitric acid. The nitrogen cycle, so we're talking about these NO2 cycles. And I do have a video um, that just specifically is going to go through this slide very carefully, one step at a time. So the next instructional video will talk very simply about the nitrogen cycle, one step at a time. We're going to visit each part of this uh, particular diagram. So in the next video link, you're going to go through the nitrogen cycle. So I'm going to stop the video here. The next video you'll play for instructional purposes will take you through this cycle one step at a time. When you're done with that, you'll have just a little bit of wrap up on your chapter where it's going to go through and talk about nitrogen fixation in, in terms of the world food supply. And just take a look at how nitrous oxides and sulfur dioxides throughout the United States emissions have been um, kind of under control, much so more so than, uh, than in the past. You can see that it's going down. And you'll also have an opportunity to kind of finish your reading about uh, the effects of acid rain in terms of rusting metals. Billions and billions of dollars are spent annually to protect our bridges, cars, buildings, and ships from the above reaction. So here we have a metal, such as the major component of steel, such as iron, reacting in an acid that starts to destroy the metal. 
So here we have metallic iron getting hit by acid rain destroys the metal, creating aqueous ions. And you can kind of see that in this particular picture where we see a statue over time being affected by acid rain. 1944 is at George Washington, made of limestone, again calcium carbonate, major constituent of coral reefs and so forth. As it gets hit with uh, acid rain, you can see that definite decomposition occurring. The calcium carbonate, when it gets hit with rain, releases the carbonate and goes to form carbonic acid. So limestone and marble slowly dissolve in the presence of acid rain, giving off that carbon dioxide water. It's a very familiar reaction by the time we're done with this chemistry. And the last thing we'll look at, kind of in a sapling practice, taking a look at each of these reactions and how we could match them to the type of reaction they are. Here's one we just looked at. We have metallic iron getting hit with acid. So a metal is being decomposed by acid. This is called corrosion. So here we have corrosion of the metal. Here we have carbon dioxide and water forming glucose and oxygen. Carbon dioxide being absorbed by water being reacted there. We know that's a process that plants undergo. It's called photosynthesis. That's why we want to plant a tree, take up the excess uh, carbon dioxide. Here we have molecular oxygen reacting with atomic oxygen producing ozone. O3 is ozone. So here we're forming ozone. Molecular nitrogen reacting with molecular hydrogen forming ammonia. We've learned this process is known as the Haber-Bosch process. The Haber-Bosch process won a Nobel Prize in World War II for the production of ammonia. Here we have sulfur trioxide combining with water to produce an acid. This is what we refer to as any SOx, sulfur trioxide, being absorbed by water is producing acid rain. And so we just get to practice the category of the, the pattern of chemistry that we're seeing and matching it to the overall pattern. And wrapping up your lessons as you're reading through, you're looking at the industry and how it affects our environment in terms of acidifying our oceans. I'll conclude our lesson here, wrapping up your outline and completing your video notes.